Good morning to everyone. Today is page 101, ST 44.10. Pula Garani Sutta, S 9.8. The discourse on the house mistress of family. This, this sutta has the alternate name of Ogal Sutta, the discourse on having plunged. Yeah, having plunged refers to the two meanings here. One is to go into retreat, to go into the forest for retreat, or to attain deep meditation leading to some levels of awakening. Pula means family, Garani, something like someone who lives in the house. And the long E or the long I shows his feminine, so the first to a woman. This sutta is a very short one. It shows about this monk who is meditating and then uh, this family is very impressed with the peacefulness of this monk. This family supports the monk and it helps this monk to practice more easily, more comfortably. And in no time, the monk reaches his goal, his awakening. So here is where we see uh, the practice of a person going very pleasantly, all the good karma are there, and the person is not distracted by comfort and pleasure, and the family also benefits from this very happy situation. Now let's look at the sutta, then I will comment a bit more as necessary after that. The translation is on page 103. The discourse on the house mistress of family. Of family here means she's of a kind of high status, very wealthy perhaps, or respectable. S9.8, section 1. On one occasion, a certain monk was dwelling in a certain jungle grove in Kosala. Okay, here we don't have any specific except the country, Kosala. Okay. So, the teachings just says at on one occasion. But this on one occasion it has a very profound meaning. It can be any time. This is a reference to right now. Whenever you open the sutta, you look at it, that is the occasion. So there is a timelessness of the sutta. The sutta is not old literature. You read a story, it's all gone in the past, that's it. It's not, not at all like that. Remember, I often say that the sutta is like a computer program. It's much more correct to compare the sutta to a computer program. Computer programs, every line is important and you must run the program in a proper sequence. And when you run the program in a proper sequence, you get this application that you need. But if you remove a word or you, a line is missing, you find a program as not work. So you need to follow this sequence. And you don't want the program just as it is. You want what the program does. So suttas work in the same way. So what does the sutta teach us? This is what we must ask. So the moment you open a page of the sutta, you look at the sutta, this program starts running. That's on one occasion. A certain monk, no monk is named here, there's no famous monk, no great monk, a certain monk, it could be anyone, any monk. In fact, the word monk, bhikkhu, according to the commentator, it refers to anyone who meditates, any one of us who is interested in mental cultivation, mental development, it refers to us. The monk is mentioned because he is always, often present before the Buddha, to listen to the Buddha's teaching. He's the occasion for the Buddha's teaching. So the Buddha gives him the teaching. The teaching is preserved through this monk down to the ages, right down to our time. Can you imagine this document before you has been handed down over the last 2,500 years? You know, some books, just a few hundred years, written a few hundred years ago, are lost. 
even Shakespeare's folio, some of them are lost. Even Beethoven's music, some a few of them are lost. We do not know where they are. Some of the great paintings by some of the great masters are lost. That's only a few hundred years. But for this sutta to be 2,500 years old and still present to us today in Pali is a wonderful arrangement itself. And this is partly because of the wisdom and genius of the Buddha. He knew how to teach the Dharma. He got the monks to memorize the teachings and a system of uh, reciting the teachings, handing down to the oral tradition and then later the written tradition and so on. And now we translate this Pali text into English so that we can understand them in a language familiar to us. So the word certain monk can be any one of us who was practicing. And he was dwelling in a certain jungle grove, any peaceful place you go to, you, you, you go to for your meditation, even here as you sit peacefully, that's your jungle grove. These monks go to the jungle grove to a quiet place for meditation, not because it's a jungle grove. So we begin to see a deeper meaning in every word in the sutta. And then you have Kosala. So Kosala here is a country, a very powerful country in the Buddha's time. So Kosala here represents the historical aspect. This is not just a story, it's, it really happened. You see the deep meaning in just one line, very opening line in the sutta. Then the sutta continues. Now here it's not the Buddha talking, it's the narrator. Okay? It's the person who's recording the sutta for our benefit. Of course, this person probably has met the Buddha himself. He knows all these teachings, so he's giving us the context of the Sutta. What happened? Who were the characters? Where it happened? And so on. In some Suttas, we are even given the place, exact place, exact time, who were present, and so on. Section 2. Now, at that time, that monk was dwelling intimately involved with a certain family. Now if you, are read, if you are read just this line, you say, oh dear, there's something not very good here. Intimately involved with a certain family. But Sutta surprises. In this case, the word, the phrase intimately involved is what appears to us. It's not the real situation. Here. Of course, there are cases where even today you see forest monks and famous monks intimately involved with lay people. And that will affect their progress. That affects their reputation. And sometimes they get into serious trouble with their seniors. But here, we are in for a surprise. So this is the drama. You know? the, the scene opens with this monk very close to this family. And this monk is living in the forest. Okay, now we, we come to chapter 2, part 3, section 3. Eh? Then a deity who was staying in that jungle grove felt compassion for that monk, desiring his good, wishing to arouse a sense of urgency in that monk. He assumed the form of the housemistress of that family. Okay, we have a bit of drama here. So this deity is compassionate. It's not often you get this kind of situation. In fact, I think this is one of the rare occasions where, where a deity, a, 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 a deva, a, a god, is mentioned to be compassionate and is living in a jungle. So it's not a very powerful god. He is called, what's called an earthbound deity, a terrestrial deity. Very limited powers, but much more powers than we have anyway. So he feels compassion for this man. So one possible reason is that he must have been a past relative. So if he knows this man is supposed to be meditating. And you know, these devas, they became devas because of a lot of good karma they have done before. So they also have a lot of goodness in them. So he's, he's compassionate towards the man. He wants the man to progress. But it's not too happy watching this monk very close to the lady of the family. Also remember the devas are not enlightened, so their wisdom 
is also limited. They may have great compassion, but the wisdom is still limited. So anyway, he wants to help this man. So he changes himself to look like this lady of the family. Then he approached that man and addressed him in verse thus. Okay, very often you find the deities, the devas, will address the Buddha, or the Buddha will address the deity in verse. This is a very well-known literary convention. You see this in Shakespeare. You may ask, why is it sometimes the actors in Shakespeare speak in verse, sometimes in prose? Usually when the Shakespeare writes something in verse, it will be royalty speaking, or someone speaking to royalty, usually. Okay? In the suttas also, you find when the Buddha speaks to well-educated priests or royalty, the Buddha will speak in verses. And very often in the suttas, you find the verses also <coughs> summarize the teachings are given at the end. Of course, we're not sure whether the verses are earlier or the prose texts are earlier. They're still subject to debate by the scholars. Anyway, in this sutta, the teachings are given in verses. So let's look at the first verse. The first verse is spoken by the deity. The deity says, Nadi tire su santane subasu ratiya sucha sabasu ratiya sucha jana sangama mantenti Mancha Tancha King Antaranti. Meaning, on the river bank, in the rest house, in the meeting halls, and along the carriage path, people meeting one another wonder about what's going on with you and I. Okay? Now, look at this verse. The Deva says, between you and I. So this Deva has assumed the form of the lady, you see? So he's trying to admonish the monk. So this monk is close to the lady, you see? So this Deva assumes the form of the lady and says, you know, people are talking about us. Say, so why are you and I so close? Now, this monk is very wise. In fact, he, he has probably attained some level of awakening and he knows what's going on. He knows it is not really the lady of the house, it is a deva. So this is where he gives teachings, returns the teaching, returns the compliment to the deva by answering in two verses. And this is the, the two closing verses. The man says, Rahu Abahuhi Sada Pachuha Kami Taba Tapasina Natena Manku Hot Tabang Itena Kilesati Meaning many other words that sound contrary that an ascetic must be patient with. One should not be troubled by that, for one is not defiled on that account. Okay? So, the man here is saying, don't worry, I know what I'm doing. I think, if I'm not mistaken, the man at this point is already awakened, or is on the way to awaken, so he knows what he's doing. So he's saying, oh, you know, people say a lot of things. Uh, people say things that sometimes it's not good to hear but I'm not troubled by them because I'm doing the right thing and I know what I'm doing. So basically this is what this man replies. And the second verse Yocha Sadda Paritasi Vane Vata Miga Yatha Bahu Chitati Tammaha Nyasa Sampajate Watanti. But if one is shaken by sounds, like an antelope in the forest, then one is said to be soft-hearted, 
one's vows or practice is not accomplished. So the second verse, the monk is indirectly telling the deva that he is wrong. So this is poetry, so you have to interpret it. Notice the first line says, but if one is shaken by sound, so this is meditative language when you're meditating, right? You know, when you're meditating, the sounds of thunder is beautiful. The, there is a, a poetry on this, you know, in the Theragata, where the monk say, says that when he, as he meditates, he hears the sounds of peacocks, the sounds of animals, the thunder, the rain clouds, they sound so beautiful. So when you're meditating, all these natural sounds become like music. You're not troubled by sounds. But in our daily life, we hear people saying things which are not good, not happy. We are troubled by them. So that's the world. So here the monk is saying, we should not be shaken by sounds. Even if a, even a good monk, he hears people saying bad things. He's not shaken by it. He's calm and peaceful. Then, he says that if you are troubled by such sounds, then it's like you have gone down to the subhuman level, to the level of a very timid antelope, or deer if you like, watamiga. Antelope, the Pali word is watamiga. Watamiga, wata means wind, miga means deer. So antelope in Indian, uh, in Pali, literally is wind deer. In other words, the moment this deer hears the sound, it lies off like the wind, out of fear. So the monk is saying, if you have this kind of attitude, then you won't be able to be peaceful. You, you, you'll be troubled like the deer, the moment you hear a sound, sad, you disappear, you're troubled by it. But he's not like that. Then one is said to be soft-hearted, right? So you're, you're not strong, you're not mentally strong, in other words. So, then the, your vow is not accomplished. Yeah, the vow, of course, is the meditation. The practice is not successful. So, from this kind of talk, we know this monk has attained a high level of accomplishment, even, even araha. So, he basically is telling the deva, I know what I'm doing. So, this, this is a case, as I said, of a practitioner, of a monk, who is very fortunate, although he lives in the remote forest, he has a family to take care of him. He doesn't live with a family, but he lives alone in the forest. He goes in the morning to collect alms food for family, then he takes his alms food, he goes back to the forest to meditate. So the point of this short teaching, very relaxed, happy teaching, is that you can still be a good practitioner, living as a lay person, living a good life, so to speak. But if you practice meditation, you study the Dharma, you have the Dharma with you, then you find your blessing is double fold. But if you are rich and uh, you have all the blessings of health and beauty, but you like the Dharma, then you will not be happy. And no matter how rich you are, you have a lot of things, but you are not happy, really. So, what is meant here is that, in a sense, you can have the best of both worlds. You can be a layman, and you can still practice the Dharma, and awaken in this life if you aspire to stream winning. Now, this is something very important we should know, which uh, interestingly, was not taught to us for many generations. Only this few years, I discovered this teaching in the suttas. Uh, and this reflects a very important problem in, 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 our, in the way Buddhism is taught today, 2,500 years later. We find we have all the texts, we have all the teachings, we have all the teachers, but sometimes these teachers, they just come for worldly benefits. They, they, 
the teachings they give us are more like, uh, I call it church-like teachings. Uh, teachings which, uh, in a sense, keep us together as a congregation, as a group that supports the temple, that supports the monk. So you have things like um, transference of merits, which is uh, non, which is an un-Buddhist teaching. We, we, merits cannot be transferred. Goodness cannot be transferred. I cannot say, okay, I'm, I'm doing some good stuff here, and this is not only good, but it's very wise, and I'm going to transfer this to you. <laughs> I'm not sure how that can be done at all. So, we're being told about transfer of merits, and we hear this again and again, and it's a very important ritual to many of these traditional Buddhists. But it's based on a false view, it's based on a wrong teaching, it doesn't work. And the ancestors don't benefit at all. The actual teaching Buddha gave is called dedication of merits, and it's very different. It means you do the act yourself. You prepare yourself mentally with lots of loving kindness inside you. You must have this attitude of loving kindness to your ancestor, a, a good feeling. And then you get together, you, you sort of do some kind of loving kindness meditation. And it's wonderful to do as a family, with friends. You can recite some suttas if you like. And then you wish this ancestor, this person has passed away, maybe recently, well and happy. And this person whose consciousness, if it is still around, then he may feel happy. And if it is suffering, that joy that arises in this being changes. And this being or this preta, usually it's called preta meaning departed one, will change from that unhappy form because of this joy arising in this being and is reborn in a happy state. That's how the dedication of merit actually operates. So that's one teaching which is uh, wrongly taught to us by uh, this, uh, what we can call the church monks, if you like, because they, they kind of see us as means of support of them. On the other hand, Amongst who are truly serious, teachers who are truly serious to the Dharma, they will teach us that we can, through our own effort, do this kind of prayers, if you like, for our ancestors. I mean, imagine uh, your, your parents will be more happy to see actually you, their loved ones, getting together, praying for them, rather than some strange mercenary priest who chant some things, nobody understands, everybody wants a ritual to finish quickly and then you pay quite a hefty sum for all these things. And nobody is happy in fact, it's just a social ritual. But if you do it properly with lots of loving kindness and you remember this person who has passed away dearly, everything goes well that way. But even more wonderful than this is the teaching which the Buddha gives us in chapter 25 of the Sangha Nikaya, where the Buddha says, if you as a layman, the Buddha is not talking about monks, he's talking about laymen like us, with families, with businesses, who are working, who are busy. If you constantly reflect on impermanence, regularly everything is impermanent, and you find it's easier for your meditation also. And this reflection on impermanence, the Buddha says, if you do it regularly, it will guarantee that you will attain stream winning in this life. If not, the Buddha says, certainly at the last moment of this life, when you are passing away, you will attain the state of stream winning. Stream winning is a poetic term meaning you get into the stream that flows to Nirvana. Actually, it's the boat that flows upstream to Nirvana. The meaning is that you will take your first step on the Noble Eightfold Path, on the way to awakening, within seven lives of the most. And this is all clearly stated in chapter 25, there are ten suttas there, all the ten suttas tell us the same thing. The Buddha guarantees that you will attain stream winning, you will attain the first stage of the path to awakening, path of awakening in this life itself. The strange thing is, none of these missionary monks, none of these church monks, never taught us all these things, despite the facts, according to some of people I know, they've gone to some temples 10-20 years, 
We never taught this thing. This is the real thing we want to know about Buddhism. That we can awaken in this life. Otherwise, what's the point of being a Buddhist? To be a Buddhist is to be free from suffering. And we know how to do it in this life itself. So this Sutta gives us that happy message where you can do it yourself. Monks are not priests, they are teachers. Uh, we don't need any kind of external agency. We look within ourselves. The truth is in here, not out there. And if you understand this, you practice this way, you close your eyes, you see more of yourself. You understand the Dhamma better and you are awakened in this life itself in no time. Okay, so that's the Sutta for today. We end here for today. Let's close with a short reflection. There are many ways of studying the suttas. If you're not sure, just take a book of suttas you can find, especially something for beginners. Just open a page and look something that you can understand and just look at it and you'll find somehow the suttas will speak to you. And just keep to those passages that you can understand and those are your first steps. Don't go into the deep and difficult parts. Those are for later, later time. It's like taking food. At first we take our rice and meals and we drink some soup. And we go on like that. And later we take the sweet things, the dessert. So starting sutta is also like that. Take your baby steps and advance from there. And suttas, you have to kind of read them again because they're not like newspapers. They're more like life's instruction manuals. So go on reading until you understand them and you find as you progress through life, your understanding of the sutta also elevates itself, erases, the meaning deepens. And you find, you understand better what's going on in the suttas and better still, you understand what's going on in your own life. This is what the suttas does to us. The suttas talk about us, how to be happy. Reflecting in this way is very good karma. But upon such karma, may we be blessed with the wisdom and the courage to aspire to attain stream winning, the very first step towards the path in this life itself. By the same token of goodness and the power of the three jewels, let us send out our loving kindness to all our loved ones and friends and relatives and people who are practicing the Dharma, that they may be well and happy too and attain their goal of even awakening in this life itself. And also let us send out our loving kindness to all those people who have difficulties in struggling with the Buddha's teaching and seeking happiness. May they find the truth that happiness in this life itself. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.